Thank you. Uh, Carlos asked that I not yell at him for giving me the last talk, but it is the last talk on the last day on Friday, so thank you, Carlos. So let me whip through IVC injuries. You guys already talked about it and heard about it, and you probably know what to do since you had the panel discussion. But you know, it's always useful to start off by just talking about a case. And this is a young gentleman. And Carlos told me that East Riverside Drive is, I guess, a place where you get a lot of your trauma, so why not? Anyway, he was hypotensive. He came into the ER's primary and secondary survey revealed an agitated, hypotensive patient. Here's his gunshot wound. Here's a better view. Um, his fast was positive. Again, he's hypotensive, rigid abdomen. Here's his KUB, which shows the projectile. He was uh, taken to the operating room, and here's his uh, hematoma. It is a video that, uh, as Kenji warned me, the videos don't work. So anyway, it's a retroperitoneal hematoma. We finally got in, and here's the injury. It's an IVC injury below the renals. So our options were repair, shunt, and ligand. I'm sure the audience could probably tell me what we should do, but before we get to that, let's just talk about real quickly IVC injuries. We know that they're pretty rare, and as you would expect, they're more common after penetrating injury than blunt injuries. But even though they are uncommon, they still account for about 40% of all vascular injuries, and like I said, the mechanism is mostly penetrating. It does have a high mortality. Uh, probably as many as half of them will die before they get to the hospital. Then in another 30 to 50 percent may die once they do reach the hospital. And I think it's useful to look at a lot of case series. It's an uncommon injury, but it's good to see sort of what other centers experiences. And you can start seeing the mortality is anywhere from the 50s, 30s, as high as 56 percent. And at least one place has very uh, low mortality. I'd like to see what they're doing and see if we can replicate those kind of uh, outcomes. Again, there's a high associated injuries, nearly 100 percent, and it makes sense. If you look at the anatomy, you see where the IVC is situated in the retroperitoneum, right next to a lot of important structures. So injury to the IVC is more so associated with injuries to other structures. Just like our patient that we took to the operating room, here's his retroperitoneal hematoma. He also had an injury to the head of the pancreas. So um, as in all patients who come in with major vascular injuries, they really present one of three ways, either arresting, unstable, or stable. Interestingly, with IVC injuries, only about half of them will present unstable or arresting. That means a good 50 percent of them come in with stable vitals, and that's because it's a retroperitoneal structure and these uh, injuries usually get tamponaded. And if you see some of these pictures, this is usually what you find when you get in the operating room, a nice tamponaded retroperitoneal hematoma. And in fact, usually they don't start getting into trouble until you open that hematoma. So you definitely have to communicate with your anesthesiology colleagues before you open that up. Now, management, again, I think it's important to just keep with the basics, trauma 101. And it's important to know the anatomy as well. So as in all our trauma patients who come in suspected of having a vascular injury, you want to stop the bleeding. And then for these patients, even though there's a variety of methods that we can use to stop the bleeding, it's going to be surgical control. And I think we've heard, you know, during this conference, a number of people have alluded to the damage control resuscitation process. And I think something that's very important, something to keep in mind, is like I like to reiterate with our residents, is this concept of permissive hypotension, meaning that it's okay if their pressure is low. We don't want to flood them with fluids before we get control of this vascular injury. Next thing is to know what the anatomy is, and I think it, it's useful to go through the anatomy, the IVCs. It basically starts as a confluence of your common iliac veins at about L5. You have your infrarenal uh, section, which is, accounts for about almost half of all injuries. You have your perirenal and your suprarenal uh, IVCs, which account for about 20 percent of injuries. You have your retrohepatic IVC, luckily it's a lot less, about 15 to 19 percent of injuries. And then the suprahepatic or the supradiaphragmatic, which is about 2 percent to up to 10 percent of injuries. And as can you can imagine, depending on the location of the injury also dictates the mortality. Basically, the best uh, outcomes are going to be those with the infrarenal IVCs. The worst outcomes are going to be the retrohepatic and suprahepatic IVC. So you're in the operating room, and this is basically what you're going to find is a zone one 
one retroperitoneal hematoma. We know what we do with those. We want to explore those patients. But I think, like I said before, you have to have communication with the anesthesiology because before you explore, the patient's stable. As soon as you open up that hematoma, you're going to basically take away the tamponade effect and the patient's going to bleed and they're going to get hypotensive. And in fact, a lot of deaths occur on table when you open up that hematoma. So you have to have some communication with uh, anesthesiology. Next is exposure. The best way to get to that IVC is a medial visceral rotation. Again, you take the right colon, you move it over medially, and then you get the duodenum and you get that out of the way too. So that's called a medial visceral rotation. You'll get access to the IVC. Next, once you have access to the IVC, now you want to get control. Best ways to get control, I think, is using your, 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 your sticks and just put pressure down above and below the injury. Get a vascular clamp is really useful. And for those who are lucky enough to have residents, just have the finger which is absolutely a beautiful way to get control of any injuries. Now, actually, Dr. Scalia actually talked about this method, which I think is useful. I've used it a couple of times, where you actually roll up a lap laparotomy sponge, put pressure right on the injury, and slowly roll it back. And as you're rolling it back, you start identifying the injury. And I like to use um, um, Babcocks. You know, Dr. Scalia talks about using Alice clamps. I think Babcocks are atraumatic, and they're very useful to put them on the injury, and then you get control that way. And then you can just repair it uh, once you have control. Now the big questions are repair versus ligate. And if you read the textbooks, they have some very complicated uh, repair methods. And these adjuncts such as patches, tube grafts, stent grafts, we don't really do that. And this really comes down to either repairing or ligating in these patients. So the re really it all comes down to what the hemodynamic status of the patient is and also the location of the injury. Obviously, if they're unstable, you probably want to do the, the quickest thing, which is usually ligating and then getting out of the operating room. So if it's an infrarenal injury, your choices are repair or ligate. And if you repair, here's a nice example where you get control proximal and distal. Sometimes putting vessel loops proximal and distal is a very nice way. And you can see the injury. So you can even have your second year resident repair that injury with a proper exposure. Here's an example where you have the proximal and distal control with your vessel loops. You isolate the injury and you can clean up the edges as much as you need to. And then once you have that done, you try to repair the injury, and it's usually a 4-0 or a 5-0 proline every time, running suture. And for those, and here's uh, the repair that's uh, completed, and really minimal narrowing of the injury. And uh, for those that have a through and through injury, again, you want to repair the posterior side through the anterior injury, which uh, sometimes you may have to extend that anterior injury just to get to the posterior injury and then repair that. Now, in terms of what we know or don't know in terms of the outcomes for repair, we talk about what is the critical degree of narrowing. We're always told that you can't narrow it greater than 50 percent, otherwise you have an increased risk of PE or DVT. The reality is we don't know that. I mean, there's a, a number of uh, cases where the narrowing was greater than 75 percent and the patients have done just fine. Not much outcome and follow-up on these patients, but what we do know, the DVT rate can be as high as 10 percent. Patency rates on these injuries are about 85 percent, and the PE rate is really really no higher than any other trauma patients, anywhere from 2 to 5 percent. So we really don't know. We don't know what the role of filter is, and we don't really know whether these patients should be on heparin and for how long. Now what about ligating these patients? And again, um, taking that same injury, you can just ligate above and below. What I'll use is an O-silk suture and ligate, and this is what you'll see. Patients tend to tolerate it very well, and if you sort of, I think it's useful again to look at sort of what the percentage of uh, what people do at different centers, and you'll see in, in some series ligation can occur in as many as 40 percent or even 60 percent of cases, but in other places they'll tend to try to repair them more, whether it's 20 to 30 percent or even down lower to 10 percent in terms of all their injuries. But again, I think it really depends on how stable the patient is, the physiologic status of the patient. And once, if you do have the need to ligate the IVC, you want to watch for lower extremity edema. Some places will do prophylactic, IV, um, prophylactic fasciotomies, like at Emory. We usually sort of do them selectively and just watch the patient in the ICU.
Follow-up is very limited, but it seems to be tolerated well. Probably the best follow-up is this series from Emory where they um, ligated about 40% of their patients and they had about 40-month follow-up and all the patients that they were able to follow-up had actually no sequela of lower extremity uh, problems. So we think that it is safe to actually ligate the IVC. And the reason is, is because of their collateral circulation around the IVC. Now, if it's at the perirenal or suprarenal IVC, you really do want to repair it if you can. And I put down ligate because sometimes the physiologic status of the patient will require you to ligate. And if you look at some of the series in terms of the juxtarenal, as many as 14% require ligation, and these patients will follow up, and it actually is pretty reasonable outcomes with no renal failure and no lower extremity uh, DVTs. Um, retropatic cava, you know you want to repair. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. You really have three options with the retropatic cava. You either leave it alone if you're lucky, if it's packed and it's not bleeding, leave it alone. Or the other two options, if you're not so lucky, is excluding it or shunting it. And again, we went over this um, yesterday. The excluding is basically total hepatic isolation where you do a Pringle, you cross-clamp the aorta, then you have to get the infrarenal and the suprarenal uh, uh, um, IVC. These patients usually don't tolerate this, especially if they're hypovolemic. And this is what it looks like. Really, to get control of the suprapatic IBC, you're going to need to get a subcostal or a sternotomy or even a right thoracotomy and take down the diaphragm. So it's not as easy as just putting a clamp over the liver. And then shunt it. We talked about this yesterday. Here's a picture of the uh, uh, atrial cable shunt through a large hole in the retropatic IVC. And it's, uh, it's not easy to do. We hardly do it. So I think the decision to do this, you have to do it early. And there's in terms of you have to sort of measure out where the holes on the tube is. You can either use an ET tube or a, um, or a chest tube. Here's a picture of a patient that obviously didn't make it, but uh, we used the uh, chest tube for the atrial cable shunt. And for suprahepatic injuries, you want to repair them, obviously. And the best exposure is going to be a sternotomy or a clamshell thoracotomy where you get um, exposure like this. And this is the area that you'd have to be working on in terms of trying to repair. So predictors of outcomes, obviously the location of injury, if it's suprahepatic, retrohepatic, much higher mortality as opposed to uh, below the renals. The severity of shock, obviously, you know, if they come in moribund, they're not going to do well. And also the number of, of associated injuries, especially if those associated injuries are vascular. So getting back to our patient, whether we did the repair, shunt, and ligate, um, we ended up ligating above and below. The patient had other injuries. He was uh, in shock in the operating room. Damage controlled him. Brought him back to the operating room the next day, and he, again, he had the injury to the head of the pancreas. He ended up having to have a Whipple, and here's our um, repair. And here he is, relatively happy in the ICU. Obviously, he had a long, prolonged course, but he actually did well. So in conclusion, IVC injuries are rare, highly lethal, and then basically um, outcome and also plan and management depends on where the injury is. You try to repair it if you can, but ligation is well tolerated.